All right, now, this is uh, Professor Lawson back at you. I bet you guys probably couldn't wait. You're just like, I cannot wait until we get the next episode of Along With Lawson. <laughs> I'm just joking. We, we, so um, today we're going to be talking a little bit about the Miski case, because uh, it's kind of been in the news a little bit. There's been a lot of news lately um, with the uh, uh, primary elections going on here in Hawaii and other stuff going on, the COVID pandemic. So, you know, this has been in a little news, this being uh, the Miski case. And, and what the latest news is that he's seeking to be released uh, on home incarceration. Um, in other words, he's seeking bail. And so part of the, you know, what I want to tell you about, uh, at least with respect to uh, this case, is give you a little information. What does a judge consider when he or she is determining whether or not a federal uh, uh, defendant should be uh, granted pretrial release or granted bail? All right. And so I'm going to show you a few slides. We may not go the full time today because this really, you know, it's not going to take long to talk about. Um, but let's get to it. All right. So we can go to our first slide. All right, so we got the eighth. So, so bail. People say you have a right to bail, and to us, you know, and and, and uh, that's partially true. But here's where we get it from: Eighth Amendment, the Eighth Amendment to your Constitution and my Constitution, the United States Constitution says, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Now, Miski may end up arguing the Eighth Amendment for two reasons. One, bail, and two, uh, the death penalty is normally challenged through the Eighth Amendment. You see that part up there on that slide that says, nor a cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. If you ever see people challenging the uh, death penalty, it's based on that part of the Eighth Amendment and the 14th Amendment. But I don't wanna give you a common law class today. I wanna talk about bail today. But so excessive bail, shall not be required. And so now what Miski is arguing is, look, uh, judge, the government wants you to detain me on this indictment, what indictment, this RICO indictment, where the possible penalty could be death because he's charged with uh, murder for hire. Um, and, and, and again, the, the, the government is seeking the death penalty. If you go back to one of my last videos, a, a couple of weeks ago, we did, uh, I did a talk about this or a class on this, um, where I told you that Bill Barr has to be the one that, that gives the local U.S. attorney, and our local U.S. attorney here is Ken G. Price, Bill Barr, the United States Attorney General, has to say to our local U.S. attorney, Ken G. Price, go ahead, you can institute the death penalty in this case. So, um, but anyway, so that's the possible penalty that Miski's facing as indictment. But Miski's saying, look, hey, you know, uh, I haven't been convicted of anything yet. Uh, and under the Eighth Amendment, I'm entire, entitled to bail. And right now the government is saying, Judge, that you shouldn't even set a bail. I should not get uh, pretrial release. I should not be allowed out um, because of my indictment uh, and because of the serious nature of my indictment. And so uh, I think it's unconstitutional and I think I'm entitled to bail. Let's go to our next slide. So Missy's gonna argue, right? And so the, the courts look at this. Um, what is the purpose of bail? And so there's a lot of, um, there's so much to this. Um, so you, some of you may know about the Bail Reform Act that's been going around, right? It's been a big um, political issue, bail reform. Uh, and, and, and what bail reform is talking about is uh, right now bail is used uh, to hold pretrial detainees. Sometimes it's excessive. Uh, sometimes um, it could just be for a misdemeanor. Let's, let's say that you're here in Hawaii and you get arrested for, let's say, disorderly conduct and uh, open flask, right? And let's say that, that, that you may not have that much money. You work you, 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 you live paycheck to paycheck and you get arrested for being out because of the COVID pandemic. You've just been tired. You, you just can't take being in the house anymore. So you go out, you have your uh, uh, bottle of Boone's Farm wine. <laughs> or my, my favorite, Thunderbird. So you got your bottle of Thunderbird, open flask, 
And an officer comes by, what's that you're drinking? And you say, uh, Thunderbird. What's the word Thunderbird? And I says, hey, man, you can't have this out here in the open flask. And you start cursing the cop out. So you get arrested for having an open flask, alcohol container, whatever, and disorderly conduct for cussing the cop out. So now you get arrested, put in jail, and they say, your bond is $1,000. And you can't make that bond. So you have to sit and wait until your trial. And it could be three or four months down the line. And so bail reform says, and again, so you sit in jail for 90 days on charges where more than likely, even if you get convicted, you end up getting probation. And so a lot of people in bail reform are saying, look, you, you know, one, you're doing, you're punishing a person on the front end, i.e. before they even been convicted they're serving time in jail for uh, offenses to where even if they were convicted, they probably wouldn't even get jail time anyway. And so what is the purpose of bail? Bail is to make sure that you will appear in court. And it doesn't take money a lot of times, right? And so what has to happen is the prosecutor has to be able to demonstrate to the court by preponderance of the evidence why bail should be set. Why should my bail be $1,000 and, and I'm unemployed? So the judge will have to look at it. Look, what's he charged with? He's charged with disorderly conduct and open flags. And you're asking, and Mr. Prosecutor, you're asking for a thousand dollar bond? Yeah, I am, uh, Your Honor, because he he cussed out a cop, and he's walking down the street with a, a a bottle of open Thunderbird. What's the word? So anyway, and 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 what what the defense is arguing is, look, that's unconstitutional, right? The only purpose of bail. And, and, and again, as you can see where it says presence to trial, the only purpose of the bail is to make sure that the person will come back to, not the only purpose, but the court found in this, in this case that I have up on this slide, Stack versus Boyle, right? This is 1951. This is how long, is, right? The court found that the defendant's bail cannot be set higher than an amount that is reasonably likely to ensure the defendant's presence at trial. And so if I'm sitting in the court with an open flash charge and, and cussing out a cop disorderly conduct, and I'm saying, judge, here's my residence, here's my house. I'll be back in court. I don't need you to set a thousand dollars. I can't make a thousand dollars. And so the judge could say, you know what? There's no evidence that he won't show back up in court. And so I'm gonna grant what they call an OR bond, right? You just sign out, you promise to the court by signing that you will return to court. Um, and so there's a lot of bail reform going on throughout the United States. And it actually, this, the studies show People say, well, you know, you should set a bond because if you let these people out, they're going to be out to commit more crimes, et cetera. And the studies show in those states that have instituted bail reform uh, to where it's no cash money bail, that, that the crime rate has not risen, uh, uh, the crime rate has not went up, and people have been showing up to court uh, just as, as much as they did before. So it's really not, um, uh, it, it really does work. The, the bail reform and it saves taxpayers a lot of money because those 90 days I had to sit in, 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 in jail waiting on my trial for uh, open flask and disorderly conduct, the taxpayers is paying a ton of money for each day I'm sitting in jail. And we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars just to hold me in there for 90 days. All right, so let's go to the next slide. So now we have, remember that the previous slide was you have to be, bail has to be set to where you can show that the person is going to come to trial. And it can't be excessive. If I can demonstrate to the court that I'm, I'm, I'm not going to flee and I'm, I'm going to be there, then you don't, have, you don't have to set a money bail. Now this one, the second part is what they call preventative detentions, right? What does that mean, Lawson? What's, what's preventative detention? That's when somebody's denied bail because the court fears that the accused is released, they will be a danger to the community, right? Uh, and so Congress authorized this uh, and, and Congress said, look, judge, if you find that a person in front of you, if you give them bail, it's such a nuisance, even if they haven't been convicted, that because they're so dangerous that if you release them back in the community, right? They could be a danger to the community. Then you can deny them bail. Now, go back to Catherine K. Loja's case. Some of you guys may not remember this, but so let me refresh your recollection. Remember, Catherine had been indicted. She had several indictments, but she had been indicted. And each time she was out, 
she um, remember the firefighter that the guy from the Big Island that they claim she was having an affair with, and some of the um, 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 credit cards. Remember, grandma's money was was being used by Catherine uh, to pay for hotels and stuff on the Big Island and over here, and this and for flights for this uh, some type of assistant fire chief or whatever. You know what I'm talking about. And so while Catherine is out on bond and she's being indicted, she's already been indicted. This guy's getting called to the grand jury, remember that? And so she's like uh, talking to him and convincing him to go to the grand jury and lie. In other words, while she's out on bond, she's still committing crimes. And she ended up getting charged for that. Uh, he ended up, in fact, the guy went, this, this knucklehead, I have no idea why he would do this. Went to the grand jury and actually did lie and got caught lying. Um, and so then he got charged and he squealed on Catherine and said, basically, you know, she made me, but anyway, so she's out on bond still wreaking havoc. Right. And so, so again, the court is concerned. If we release you out on bond, if we give you bail, are you going to be a danger to the community? Now, what, so what the government is arguing is, look, this guy is facing a death penalty. This guy, Miski, he was involved in what we believe was a murder for hire. He has been involved in drug conspiracies, judge. Um, there have been assaults and stuff like that from his past. We believe if you give him a bond, he's going he's gonna to go out and try to either hurt witnesses or intimidate witnesses or go back and to, to raise money for his um, criminal enterprise or continue to engage in his criminal enterprise. He's going to continue to engage in illegal conduct. And so we believe that, that he's a danger to the community. And based on the um, bail reform, based on our Bail Reform Act of 1984, we believe you should hold him. Now, this this case, the reason why, and so this happened to this guy named Salerno, right? He was a crime boss from New York. And Salerno was held sort of like Miski, right? with no bail. And the government said, look, we're not going to give him any bail. And Salerno argued, go back to the, can you go back to that slide where we showed the Eighth Amendment? And so Salerno argued, look, he said, judge, you see what it says? Eighth? He said, judge, look, in 1984, this is Salerno arguing. He said, Congress, Congress passed this law, judge, in 1984, talking about that I can be held uh, if, they, if the government thinks that somehow I'm a danger to the community. And that's unconstitutional. That's against the law. And the judge is like, why do you say it's against the law? Well, it violates what? The Eighth Amendment excessive bail, right? It's excessive. In fact, you have to give me some type of bail. And to hold me without bail, just because you're claiming I'm danger to the community, is it's, it's unconstitutional. Now, Salerno wasn't arguing that his lawyer was arguing it for him, but that was argument. So it went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. Because what, what Solano was arguing, can we go back to that preventative detention slide real quick? So what Solano's lawyer is arguing is, look, this Bail Reform Act, the same one that's holding Miski, right? But, but Solano argued this back in 1987. He said, that, is unco that act is unconstitutional. The Eighth Amendment says, you got to give me bail. And what the Supreme Court said is, no, we don't have to give you bail. That's not what the Eighth Amendment means. It just says no excessive bail. Doesn't mean that we can't hold you. The court held that only limitations imposed by the bail clause is that the government, the government's proposed conditions of release or detention not be excessive in light of the perceived evil. What, what, what does that mean, Lawson? What they're saying is, look, if, if the government can show that, that if they let you out, you're gonna be such a danger to the community then holding you with no bail doesn't violate the Eighth Amendment. See that last sentence in there where it says, the court held that the only limitation imposed by the bail clause is that the government's proposed conditions of release or detention not be excessive. In light of what? In light of the perceived evil. What's the perceived evil? In light of the, the stuff you can do if we let you out, right? And so what the government has to show. And, and you know, while I'm doing this show, I think today, well, I know today is August 11th, and I think Miski is is having his detention hearing either while we're, while I'm actually taping the show. Um, and so I don't know what the outcome is going to be. You want me to guess? I would guess the judge is going to hold him um, and not grant uh, him a bail. 
because of the seriousness of the offense and the fact that it, um, um, the penalty is death, right? And so the question could be, well, I believe that, you know, the fact that you're facing death penalty, you have means and monies to escape and you may not come back to court, right? That's the, remember, that's the first part that we talked about. The part that says, you know, bail should, should be set, on, you know, to make sure that you can assure the appearance of the defendant. And the second one is this, if we let you out, so we know you're going to come back to court, right? We knew Kat Kaloha was going to come back and make her court appearances, but why are you out? Is you going to be out there committing crimes, right? And if that's true, we're going to hold you. Um, and so again, going back to it, I think the court may, uh, I think the court's going to, my guess is the court's going to hold him without granting bail. Uh, but let's go to the next slide. Because what does the court look at, right? So, so what, what, does, what does the judge have to look at, right? The court must consider the following factors in determining whether conditions of release can be fashioned, which will reasonably assure community safety. See that? The two things we just talked about. Oh, community safety and uh, assure. Can, can you put the whole slide up there for me real quick? Because I, I, want, I want our students to focus on this real quick. So, um, the release can be fashioned, which will reasonably assure community safety and what? The defendant's appearance. So, Miski, if we let you out, will the community be safe? And if I let you out, even though you're facing a death penalty, will you come back to court? And Miski said, yeah. Oh, so what does the judge have to look at? The nature and circumstances of the offenses charged. Okay, RICO conspiracy, right? Drug conspiracy, conspiracy to commit murder for hire and murder, right? Now, what's the evidence against the person? The judge has to look at that. How much evidence do you got against him? Right? To, and, and, and the third one, the history and character, you know, the, the history and character of the person and the nature and seriousness of the danger to any person or community that would be posed by the person's release. So all that, you know, so the judge has to look at all those factors. Okay, and so what does the judge do? He has to wait. They call that, it's what's called in, in the legal profession, preponderance of the evidence. And y'all like, well, look, there you go with that bullshit, that the BS again. What does that mean? Preponderance just means more likely than not. So whenever you're watching like Perry Mason or you're watching some of your crime shows and you hear the parts be judge, they haven't proved by y'all have heard reasonable doubt. They haven't proven beyond a reasonable doubt, right? That's not right. That's reasonable doubt is the highest legal standard, legal burden you have. Preponderance is another standard, right? And so preponderance of the evidence just means more likely than not. 51%. If, it, if I can show you, Judge, just fit, if the scale just tips a little bit in this favor, that's preponderance. So I had to show, I being the prosecution, had to show by preponderance of the evidence that, that basically either Missy's is going to be a danger to the community or that if you release him on bond, he's not going to appear. And so that, that's what the hearing is about. So they had to go down and argue, and Missy's going to put on some evidence. In fact, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, what's, is it, what's Misky's argument? And so Misky said, look, put me on home confinement. In fact, what Misky says in his, in his filings by his lawyers is, send me home, put an electric monitoring thing on my ankle. You'll know where I'm at at all times. And then judge, at my own expense, we can put cameras outside of my residence at every exit so that you know that, I, that the probation department who can monitor me 24 seven will know I'm not leaving and they'll know who's coming and who's going. Misky is also saying I will not have access to social media uh, or, or anything like that. So judge, if you, if you do that, um, and we'll go to the next slide real quick. Um, and so that's what he's asking for, right? He's asking for home and confinement. And so, Part of what his argument is this. He says, that, look, I got strong community ties. And so in his motion, he says um, that, that I have businesses here. They're legitimate businesses. I have strong community ties. I have family. here. I've been here all my life. So I'm not a, a risk to leave or, or, or a flee the jurisdiction because I'm so tied to the community. Um, he said, Misky says, I have lack of recent convictions. I have some convictions is what Misky's arguing. Right. Well, I haven't done anything. I've been a good boy the last few years. And so 
Um, now, there's one case of assault that's still pending from one of his barroom brawls, but he had, but no recent convictions. So that's another reason, Judge, for you to let me out. Now, you can go ahead and put, and put me back up on the screen real quick. He's also saying this. That I've been knowing. Here's what Miski is. His lawyer's just saying, look, we've been knowing y'all been investigating uh, me. This is Miski talking, right, through his lawyers. Hey, look, I've been knowing y'all been investigating me for years. I knew about the subpoenas to my bank for my bank records, I didn't run. I knew y'all was investigating me for uh, dealing drugs. I didn't run. I didn't flee the jury and I could have left. In fact, I kind of knew you guys were eventually going to indict me. That's why I'd hired lawyers a long time ago. And I still didn't run, right? And even during the investigation, I didn't threaten no witnesses. I didn't kill, you know, uh, kill no witnesses. I didn't, I, I didn't do anything. And so because I haven't gotten in any trouble over the last few years, because I haven't threatened any witnesses, because also y'all know that, um, um, that I knew I was being investigated and still didn't run, I'm not a flight risk. And because I haven't hurt anybody or threatened anybody, I'm not a danger to, to, to the community. And I haven't committed any recent crimes. And, and so he said, on top of that, we got this COVID-19 pandemic and I have a right to see my lawyers and I have a lawyer in California. Let's back up. Anytime you're charged with a death penalty in federal court and you have lawyers who've never tried a death case, lawyers have to be death certified, death penalty certified because they're so complicated. Um, I was able to try cases in, in Ohio from um, death penalty cases. But because Hawaii doesn't have any death penalty cases, I don't know of any lawyer here in Hawaii who's certified to do them. And so they had to find one from California. So now Miski has this lawyer, court appointed lawyer from California, simply to, to, to monitor the death part of his case, right? And what that lawyer is saying is, look, I, I need to be able to, to meet with my client one-on-one -on -one because of the COVID pandemic, seeing him on Zoom meetings, like I'm, you know, like we're doing this, denies him uh, uh, his right to counsel. And if counsel has to go into the federal detention center and meet with their client, local counsel, Tommy Otaki and, and uh, uh, the other sister, he has two attorneys. If they had to go into to, uh, uh, the uh, federal detention center where there's already been some COVID cases um, that have been reported coming from the federal detention center, you're putting the lawyers at risk. Wouldn't it be easier? And, and, and since I have a Sixth Amendment right, right? Remember the Sixth Amendment of the United States Constitution says what? You have a right to effective assistance to counsel. And my counsel can't be effective if they can't come in and see me because of the COVID pandemic. They can only be effective if I can meet with them, strategize with them, talk about my case and stuff like that. Uh, face to face. And I can't do that in this federal detention center through glass and I can't do it effectively through Zoom. I can't look at papers and exchange documents with my lawyers or sit down and write out stuff and go over strategy with my lawyers. And that is right, I mean, as a lawyer um, and when I practice, I mean, meeting face to face with clients, even if I went to the jail, um, to sit down face to face with them and be able to talk with them is extremely important. And that's Miski's argument uh, on why he should be released. Um, and all I can tell you is this, as, as I sign off here, is that, uh, again, this is my guess. Uh, I don't think the judge is gonna release him because one, um, there's a lot more evidence, you know, uh, let me back up, Miski's arguing, look, Part of the part of the charges is the IRS said that I was using my um, uh, what is that the exterminating business? I can't remember the name. Yeah, no, he has his exterminating business. Come on, come on, exterminating something like that, right? And the IRS is claiming, judge, that this is all an illegal uh, business that I was using as a front to commit my racketeering crimes. And he had, an, and so Miski has hired a IRS expert, former IRS agent expert, who would put provide a testimony saying, look, I've looked at all the tax records and there's nothing really unusual about these records. And as far as I can see, it's a legitimate business. It's not being used as a front. And so Miski's arguing in his, in his motion for bond is the government's case against me with respect to this RICO is weak 
they're claiming that I'm using these legitimate businesses as fronts and I have an IRS, an ex IRS specialist telling you judge expert that there's nothing wrong with my taxes. I'm not using it as a tax front to, to conduct illegal activities. And because the government's case is weak, that's another reason why I should be let out on bond, right? Now, again, I still don't think the judge is gonna do it because I think the, the, the murder charge and the fact that the penalty, the possible penalty is death, a lot of courts are gonna refrain from granting bond and bail in this kind of case because of the seriousness of the offense and the fact that uh, there may be other evidence um, like other witnesses who have now came forward and, and basically testified against Miski about his involvement in drugs and in um, the, the murder for hire scheme. And so with all that, um, all I have to say is I don't think the judge is going to let him out. If he did, he being a judge, I'd be shocked. Um, but I at least wanted to let you kind of know what happens at these bond hearings, right? It's just not that the court just sits back and says, okay, let me flip a coin and determine whether or not I'm going to let this defendant out on bond. The court has to go through certain factors uh, and why those factors uh, and what those factors are. So again, until next week, hey, this was a law with the law, law with Lawson. Um, I don't know what I'm gonna talk about next week yet, but hell, you know, this is Hawaii, man. Any kind of, anything can come up. Like this COVID pandemic and some of these goofy rules that 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 the kooky mayor, I know, and, and some of these other guys in our leadership is coming up with. Are these rules fair? Are they legal? Maybe we should talk about that. Can you challenge some of these rules? Because when you say I'm gonna shut down uh, all the bars, but I'm gonna leave open restaurants to serve alcohol till 10. Is that making it, I'm gonna shut down all the beaches and parks, but I'm gonna leave open all the gyms, even though the gyms are inside. I'm gonna close tennis courts and swimming pools, but leave gyms open. Uh, you know, and if you wanna challenge that, can you challenge it? Do the rules make sense? Do they have to make sense in order for you to challenge it? Is it the law? Maybe that's what we'll talk about next week, but until then I'm out. See y'all later.